Good, good morning, and, and welcome, um, welcome to the 28th annual Dorothy J. McLean Fellows Conference. So, um, we, we, we may start uh, the first presentation, Monica Peake's presentation, um, w without uh, the, the use of slides behind me. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us, for taking the time from your busy lives to travel from around the country and especially to be part of our annual gathering of past and current McLean Fellows. Um, I know there's a contingent here from Hillman College in Michigan who drove three hours, raise your hands, um, and because they represent new people to the, um, to the conference, uh, hearty welcome to you. Uh, it's, it's thrilling to, uh, uh, to see our numbers grow and our network expand each year. O over the past 35 years, the center has trained uh, more than 450 fellows. Um, this year, the center is training more than 30 fellows with backgrounds in medicine, surgery, nursing, psychiatry, philosophy, law, um, and I am just delighted to welcome all of you here today. Um, as you know, this conference um, is the McLean Center's signature event. Um, it remembers Dorothy Jean McLean, um, Barry McLean's mother. Uh, Dorothy Jean helped us create the McLean Center, was deeply committed to its work. Um, I, I wonder if you join me in thanking uh, Dorothy as, as long past, but thanking Barry McLean for his commitment to the center and in recognizing our current board chair, um, who's in the audience with us, Rachel Kohler. Rachel. Um, I especially want to thank the McLean Center faculty and fellows for participating in this year's conference. Um, an important highlight of the conference is the awarding of the McLean Center Prize in Clinical Ethics and Health Outcomes. And that prize will be awarded tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. to Dr. Norman Faust, who is in the audience. Norman, wel welcome to Chicago. Uh, Dean Polanski will be here to present the prize to Dr. Faust, who's an emeritus professor of pediatrics, medical history, and bioethics at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, after Dr. Faust receives the award, he will give a keynote talk entitled, stop me if I'm wrong, Norm, um, The Hermit, the Mongol, the Swimmer, Bucky, and the Dwarfs, Cases that Changed Medicine and Me. Did I get that right? Uh, I, I have two final announcements before I, I turn the podium over to Monica Peake. Um, uh, first, um, today's speakers are McLean Center faculty or former fellows. Um, after each lecture, uh, we encourage audience members to ask questions. Uh, uh, if, only if you can find the microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, we, we, we ask you to walk to a standing microphone. I, I see one. Is that the only one? We will have a second one. Um, and identify, identify yourself, please, uh, by name and your home institution. Um, also um, important that uh, this evening at the end of the conference, at around 545, there will be a group photo up here on, on the stage for faculty, fellows, and board members. So I ask you to please um, join us for that at the end of this afternoon's conference. Um, with that background, and um, with fond hopes that shortly we'll be able to project slides, even though it looks like at the moment we cannot, I'm going to ask Monica Peak to take over. Monica. Absolutely. Good morning. 
I am delighted to be here for so many reasons. It's such an honor to, to participate in this annual conference. Um, it's an honor to, to kick it off as being part of the first panel. Um, and it really is um, just an incredible amount of fun to be able to share the panel with some of my most um, respected and beloved colleagues. I have <laughs> uh, the challenge today of speaking without my slides, which I think will probably be fun, I'm hoping. Um, and what I think actually will happen is that we it may leave more time at the end for questions. So I am a general internist here at the university, and my work really focuses on health disparities. And I came to the McLean Center several years ago because I believe um, at the very core of my being that health disparities are an ethical issue, not only for clinical medicine and all of us who practice uh, the art of medicine, but also for our society and how we think about the distribution of resources. Um, and so, I chose this title, which obviously you guys can't see, but maybe you can read in your brochure, uh, The Clinical Ethics of Health Disparities, a Distributive Justice Analysis. I chose this about a year ago. Um, who knew that it would be as timely as it is today? Um, so I'm excited to be able to talk about things that are important to me um, and the lives of people that are in our community and nationally, the most vulnerable among us, um, particularly against the, the backdrop of our recent uh, political events. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge um, so, uh, just to recap, I'm someone who's interested in health disparities, um, and I'm very excited to be able to talk about those issues, um, particularly in the context of the, um, the, the, the political climate which we found ourselves in the past week. I'd like to acknowledge um, the McLean Center. Oh, geez. Okay. I'm just going to do this by hand. Um, the McLean Center, um, which is one of the places that I sit here on campus, as well as the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. Both of those centers allow me to um, think about the ethics of medical care delivery and how we can be better providers, how we can provide better care to patients. I'd also like to acknowledge the Department of Medicine. I'm a general internist within that department. And the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research. My, my main focus within health disparities is diabetes um, as I think about it as a social disease um, and how we interact with not just patients in the health system, but with people in our communities and how they struggle um, to manage their health. And so I'd like to just acknowledge all of those. <clears throat> My next slide is actually a picture of uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump to just acknowledge um, and, <laughs> and to thank them for the um, the heightened political awareness um, of our current environment and the urgent need for us to all take seriously um, what's at stake and to think more reflectively about our allocation of resources um, and what that means to promote the good of all of society, particularly those the most vulnerable among us, um, and whether or not we're going to take that road or a different one. So I think that my comments um, as I prepared my talks um, were largely informed by the events of unfolding over the past several days. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about health disparities, so we're all on the same page, about distributive justice, um, and then hopefully end on a high note, um, talking about some of the work that um, I do as part of a much broader um, network of team here in Chicago to try and address some of the disparities that we see in diabetes. Starting um, before that, just recognizing that, again, we're sitting at a McLean Clinical Medical Ethics Conference, um, and to underscore the inherent relevance um, and centrality of social justice and health disparities to clinical medical ethics. So I'm going to read um, a description that Dr. Siegler has uh, written to describe what clinical med medical ethics is. It's a medical field that helps patients, families, and health professionals reach good clinical decisions by taking into account the medical details of the situation, the patient's personal preferences, values, socioeconomic considerations, and ethical concerns. So it's not only about patients in the health system. It's about the socioeconomic standards and conditions and environments in which they live that they bring with them to the healthcare sitting, setting um, that creates some of the ethical dilemmas that we see in clinical practice. 
So when we talk about health disparities, um, we use that as a, as a, a catchphrase to mean two different things, um, both disparities in health care as well as disparities in health status or health outcomes. And clearly, uh, what we do here in the hospital in clinical care matters, um, but it really doesn't matter <laughs> as much as we think it might, unfortunately. Um, 15 to 20 percent of what physicians and nurses and all of us do within the healthcare system impacts health. The vast majority of the rest is determined by other factors outside of healthcare, poverty, education, access to healthy food, health behaviors. And so for us who think about health disparities, it really is incumbent on us to think about both of those things, disparities in health care as well as disparities in health status, one leading to the other. Um, there was an, an, uh, an important report put out by the Institute of Medicine years ago, 2001. <clears throat> called Unequal Treatment, and what it did was uh, synthesize, sort of summarize and synthesize the status of the literature about the inequalities that exist within our healthcare system. And what we know, without any uh, doubt, is that the healthcare that we deliver in this country is not equally distributed. That there are some groups, based on their uh, social, socially marginalized status, be they poor, have limited health literacy, racial and ethnic minorities, have insurance or not, um, there are a number of variables that mean that some people in our country are less likely to get equal health care than others. Some of that is determined by health insurance, and some of it's not. So even for the, those who can get into the same health system, there are differences in the quality of care that people receive just based on who they are. So that obviously is inherently unjust. Um, but thinking again about the impact that this has on health status, I would encourage us all to think um, not just about how we can change our healthcare system, and clearly there's a lot of change that needs to be done, a lot of work to do, there's no shortage of work to improve the way that we deliver care to our patients, um, but also to encourage us to think about health change changes in health systems that are outside of health care if we're ultimately trying to improve the health of our patient populations. So <clears throat> this change outside of health care we frequently refer to as the social determinants of health which a number of us have some uh, take issue with, um, because social sounds like such a positive attribute. Um, <laughs> who wouldn't want a social determinant of health? Um, but really, it's, it's more broadly thinking about those macro level factors that determine someone's health that I had talked about a little bit earlier. Those are the things that we need to incorporate um, in our thinking when we're thinking about promoting health equity. I have a few maps, which unfortunately I can't show. And, and it really is disappointing because I spent a lot of time on these slides. <laughs> it's all good. Um, showing the city of Chicago, which is very um, segregated based on income, class, race, and a number of other social variables. Um, and particularly for those of us who study specific diseases, the maps of disease burden um, completely aligned with uh, social variables. So the southern parts of the city, the western parts of the city where there is a lot of poverty, a lot of people who are black and brown have the highest rates of almost anything, including diabetes mortality, the potential years of life lost because of diabetes, and diabetes related hospitalizations that could have been avoided but weren't. So how is this conversation about equity again, related to medical ethics and medical professionalism. And I would just remind us that um, it's actually core to how we think about both of those things, that part of our mission as medical professionals is to support policies that decrease health disparities um, and to be a good steward of society's resources. So these are things that I think are important, but not just me. Um, these, are, these are things that are written up in codes of ethics um, from our professional societies. Um, Dr. Siegler has written extensively about these, and so as a medical profession as we think about clinical medical ethics at its core is an issue uh, the construct of equity and fairness and how we treat everyone including allocating resources to everyone 
I'm gonna take a little pause and, and go back in time a little bit or maybe stray from uh, clinical medicine and talk a bit about John Rawls, who um, may have been one of the most important um, political philosophers of our time. Um, he's a 20th century Western philosopher. And he, his notion of justice are, uh, really revolved around social justice, where he talked about the establishment of equal liberties, of equal opportunities, um, and a fair distribution of resources and support. All, the, all of these things are necessary to see a just and fair society. He talks about the fair equality of opportunity. Um, and so it's not just that we have equity, but people have equal opportunity to, to, to become, um, to sort of uh, become their fullest selves. His principles talked about not just prohibiting discrimination or discriminatory barriers to accessing all of these wonderful opportunities in life, but actually called upon us to require positive social measures which counteract the negative effects on people's opportunities. So for example, the underdevelopment of skills and inherent talent that arise because of unfair social policy. We have so much wasted intellectual capital in our country because we choose not to educate everyone equally, and because we choose to um, put into the prison system a disproportionate amount of people who uh, should not be there. Um, so some of these unfair social policies that are legacies of historical racial bias or socioeconomic issues um, that linger in our society today, those are the kinds of uh, negative things that negatively impact people's opportunity that Rawlsian injustice calls on us to address, not just sort of thinking about not having barriers in place, but actually putting pos positive social measures in place. And I could not help but think about the parallels between this and our U.S. Declaration of Independence. And which says that we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men, and I'll use men as a placeholder for including women and minorities, are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness sort of broadly defined. <laughs> but we're not ensuring happiness, we're ensuring the pursuit of happiness. We're, we're ensuring the opportunity to be happy and satisfied um, and to have a full life that reflects your full range of opportunities. These values that are core to how we think about medical ethics um, and just societies are really very American in nature. And um, it was, it's just been striking to me to, to reflect upon these very American ideals um, in the middle of a lot of um, messy American politics. Norman, Dan Norman Daniels um, took up this idea of Rawlsian justice and applied it directly to health and health care. Um, and included as a primary social good, in addition to things like liberty, power and opportunity, income and wealth, the protection of normal functioning. Recognizing that we have to be fully whole, um, physically capable, in order to pursue the opportunities in our life. Um, and that disease and disability should not impact our range of opportunities. In particular, he recognizes that the disease burden is disproportionately borne by marginalized populations, so we're not all equally sick. And that often this disproportionate distribution of disease is due to the inequitable distribution of societal resources. Coming to the conclusion, therefore, that health disparities in themselves are inherently unjust, partially because they're derived by unjust policies that created them in the first place. And he calls upon us to provide health care vis-a-vis universal health insurance um, to everyone. Um, and I would actually argue that it's not only the provision of health care goods and services to be that we're called on to redistrib redistribute in a more equitable fashion, um, that we treat the least among us um, as well as we treat the most among us when they come into our health systems, but we think more broadly about how to address these, um, how, how to more positively address these factors that, that um, can counter people's lack of opportunities, that we think about um, housing and education, food, poverty, um, access to safe places to exercise, all of these things um, that impact people's health. So um, this is another beautiful slide, which I'm lamenting you guys <laughs> cannot see. It's all good. Um, 
<laughs> um, it talks a bit about not just our healthcare environment, but the inherent built and social environment, what we physically create man, woman made st physical structures um, that are in our environment as well as the social environment that includes things like discrimination and crime for which Chicago has become um, almost every day nationally known or international. I just came back from India and they were asking me about the crime in Chicago. Imagine my dismay. Um, but how these things together impact people's health. We do, um, Marshall Chen, who you'll hear from next, um, collaborate um, with a number of people actually in this room uh, to work on some of these pernicious disparities in health on the south side of Chicago, thinking not only about the challenges, the negative impacts on people's range of opportunities, but also the positive assets that are in the community, trying to leverage resources that exist and the strengths, um, the, the, the positive social factors um, that exist within our communities. Um, so for example, and then because the timer isn't set on and I don't have my phone, I feel like I'm just in free fall. So, somebody should let me know if I'm like way over. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Oh, good. All right. I'm coming around the bend anyway. <laughs> um, we do things to think about the built environment as well as the social environment. So we have, again, lovely pictures. I'll make sure that these get sort of posted someplace. These are uh, pictures from a food pantry that we uh, work in collaboration with um, that's here in Washington Park, so very close to us. Um, uh, pictures of the farmer's market that we work with um, to help um, provide food, um, healthy, nutritious food to people in the Washington Park community and health education, health screening. Um, we do cooking demonstrations um, to help provide, when we consider resources, knowledge is a resource, knowledge is power, um, and to help people have a better understanding of what is available in the community, how to, pr how to prepare healthy food. Um, we do tours in low-cost grocers so that people who have fixed or um, restricted um, resources can better navigate the communities in which they live um, and can better shop on a, in a more healthy way on a budget. We have food prescriptions um, that physicians can write um, at a number of locations that not only have the physician recommendation but have a financial resource incentive um, as well as knowledge as a resource to help them understand better how to um, identify the things that are low carb or low fat um, and have um, some financial assistance in, in obtaining those foods. Um, this is a picture from the farmer's market where we have a food prescription that can be redeemed there as well. Pictures are of our team at the farmer's market giving tours. We're there every Saturday. Um, and again, sort of this uh, model which talks about the built environment and some of the mechanisms through which people can take better care of themselves and ultimately have better health as well as the social environment through um, social support confidence, coping strategies, improve mental health, and so we actually do a number of things for people who have diabetes to try and think about the social environment as well. So we have a, um, a culturally tailored patient empowerment class, which I talked about a little bit last year when I was here, that helps people um, have a better sense of their own humanity and their own abilities when they're interacting with the healthcare system. Um, and not only is their health improved, but their mental health is improved and their sense of confidence is improved. They have a, a better sense of a social support network, not only amongst each other, but from the healthcare institutions, which they may or may not ordinarily feel is a safe space for them to come. Um, let's see here. Once again, having some challenges getting out of here. Well, thank you, sweetie. I just need to get down to the next one. To the next one. Oh, sure. So some of these pictures I just had up. Um, tomorrow, we actually have a community cook-off. We have one every year, which always coincides with the ethics conference. So I'm usually toggling between the, the two of them, um, where people come from the community to cook in a healthy way, um, di things that are um, diabetes friendly. And so we're trying to activate not only patients, but communities around the idea of, of health promotion um, and thinking again about not just what happens within healthcare systems, but what happens outside of healthcare systems um, to leverage resources and to promote health. 
So this is just another slide reminding us of the two kinds of disparities and really calling on us all to think not just about change within our health system, but change outside of our health system to ultimately promote the health of the most vulnerable. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to our whole team, those, um, and to particularly highlight Marshall Chen and Stacey Lindau because you're going to be hearing from them in the next few minutes. They have the advantage of having their slides ready um, <laughs> to acknowledge our funders and then to again acknowledge the places where I sit. Thank you very much. Okay. Mark says I get five minutes of questions. If there are any, there are two microphones set up. And if so compelled, you can just like yell loudly from where you're seated. All right. Oh, <laughs> thought I was off the hook. <laughs> yes, Dr. Siegel. How might the election affect <laughs> uh, the question is how might the election um, affect the problem of disparities and it's one that um, the potential negative impact on has made me extremely sad. What I would say is that we were talking right before the talk is that I would hope that this is a call to action, that for those of us who have had the, the leisure or the comfort of experiencing the best of medical care and not having to think about those who don't, that we um, acknowledge the, ch the challenges that are coming our way, and they are coming, and use this as an incentivation or motivation to do better. Um, and to work harder. It's gonna take all of us consciously every day working to maintain the gains that we've had and to try and push forward. It, it, is, it is a true challenge that we're facing. expect that question, <laughs> although I should have. Um, any more? People are probably frightened that I'll cry some more or something. <laughs>